I've played many games in my time, and many games that I've played have fucking sucked. But there were many that also stood out above others, have left an impact on me, and even shaped a bit of who I am. I believe that these games are art. It's obviously subjective, way back since the prehistoric times, to what defines something as art. There's hundreds, thousands of people out there who spend their lives trying and creating something they're passionate about, something unique, and something that people will love and cherish. And they want the world to see it, to show everyone. That, to me, is art. And the same can be said about some games. Yet there's one in particular I want to talk about, to show you all, that I hold very close to my heart. And that is Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill is an old classic horror franchise made way back when the survival Hello, horror genre was at its Markiplier. peak. And through some digging and discovering, I found out about the franchise. Sure, it was just another horror game, but there was something else to it that clicked to me. The second game in particular, and that's eventually when Silent Hill 2 became my favorite game of all time. I only got around playing this game recently, and so obviously I underestimated it considering how old it was. But little did I know that it turned out to be one of the most terrifying games I've played. I went through the game in about one sitting in complete darkness and came out with my pants fully shit. Yet the reason why I love Silent Hill 2 is because of how impactful it is. It's a very gritty and dark game. But what makes it so special is how it beautifully tells us great story using not just dialogue, but symbolism and metaphors throughout the game. On a more personal level, this game has gotten me through some tough times. In a sense, I find that I can relate to it. And no, that doesn't mean when I step outside my house, my entire world is engulfed by fog. A game so old as it is covers incredibly heavy and dark subjects such as depression, trauma, grief, and abuse, while telling a story that sticks with me till this day. A tale so well told that I have the need to share it with you. So without further ado, this is why Silent Hill 2 is what I believe to be the greatest game ever made. The game starts with our protagonist, James Sunderland, who, uh... Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know what he's doing. What a daring move to start your greatest game with your main character moaning in a restroom. How brave. Just by the first cutscene of the game, we can make out some speculations on what kind of person James is. He seems tired and exhausted, maybe even stressed. He takes his time looking in his own reflection with a thousand yard stare. James exits the restroom into the outside world as a female voice begins to take over. In my restless dreams, I see that town, Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday, but you never did. Well, I'm alone there now, in our special place. James explains the voice belongs to his wife, Mary. He states he got a letter from her, asking for him to come to Silent Hill, which couldn't be possible since Mary died of a disease three years ago. Yet the letter says that she's here, waiting for him, at their special place. Our special place. What could she mean? This whole town was our special place. Does she mean the park on the lake? We spent the whole day there. Just the two of us, staring at the water. Could Mary really be there? James sounds uncertain. He knows Mary died, but is hanging on to that bit of hope, and that motivates him to keep on going. James finds a trail leading from the parking lot, and this trail, as simple as it seems, is utter perfection in introducing the player to the game's efficient method of implementing fear. Silent Hill is one of the first games ever to successfully use psychological horror, 
very few actually make it work. And when it does, it becomes some of the most unsettling and disturbing experiences out there. As you walk down the path, you'll occasionally hear a horrible, twisted noise from somewhere in the fog. However, the source of the noise will never reveal itself. It's left to the player's imagination to interpret what's making the sound. The trail itself is quite long, which isn't riveting gameplay, but is done intentionally so the player doesn't decide to run back and have to keep pushing forward. Similar to the original Resident Evil games, Silent Hill uses these abnormal and claustrophobic camera angles. This makes it to never directly reveal the source of the noise on screen and leaves for you to guess what lies ahead. I cannot emphasize on how well this is executed and is the only reason I was terrified from beginning to end. Excuse me, I... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I... I was just... No, it's just... okay. I didn't mean to scare you. I'm kind of lost. Lost? Before we talk about Angela, I'd like to cover the voice acting of the game. I know that some of it may come off as mundane and stiff, but I do believe that this is done intentionally. It's not like Resident Evil's masterfully crafted dialogue. But it doesn't matter now, Mr. Kennedy. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? <laughs> it may not make much sense now, so I'll touch back on it later. Angela is one of the three real humans you'll meet throughout the game, and she comes off as kind of unusual. In fact, no person that you meet in this game will be quote-unquote normal. She's seen as anxious and distressed, constantly stuttering with her words and apologizing for it. She also has some childlike characteristics, such as calling her mother mama. James asks Angela directions to Silent Hill, and she says there's only one road that leads there. But before he leaves, Angela stops him. But... Yes? I think he'd better stay away. This, uh... Th this town... There's something wrong with it. It's kind of hard to explain, but... Is it dangerous? Maybe. And it's not just the fog, either. With this, we know that some of the monsters we'll encounter in the game can be seen by Angela as well, so we're not completely crazy. She accuses James of not believing her, but he simply responds that he does, he just doesn't really care. I'm looking for... someone. Someone very important to me. I'd do anything if I could be with her again. Me too. I'm looking for my mama. I, I mean my mother. Angela, like us, has come to Silent Hill with the intention of finding someone. Someone seemingly close to them. They both tell each other they hope they find what they're looking for before James leaves. James takes the road Angela recommended, and not much really happens. It's a pretty long path, but it gives the player an overview of how desolate Silent Hill really is. The entire place seems to be rotting away as it's consumed by the ubiquitous fog. James will finally reach the streets of the town, but in the distance notices a silhouette within the fog. The shadow resembles the form of a human, limping away in the distance while leaving a trail of what seems like blood. James, like any reasonable person would do, decides to follow the figure. Going after the creature, James comes upon a closed-off tunnel where he finds a radio-emitting static. These creatures are known as lying figures, and will be the most common enemy encountered in the game. Upon defeating the monster, James recalls he found a radio and takes it out of his jacket. The radio resumes playing static, but amongst it, a voice can be heard. What 
Marta. James takes the radio with him and can now be used as an item. If an enemy is within a close proximity of James, the radio static will gradually begin to increase. The game now allows the player to explore the town of Silent Hill and find their way to the park on the lake. The town is full of supplies and secrets to be found, but beware, as it's also infested with monsters. There are some memos of presumably past travelers, but don't give us too much to work on. Not only that, but they even included a street dedicated to Saul Goodman himself. Using the map, you can head north onto the main road, but will soon realize that it's cut off, and so is every other way exiting the town. With enough exploring, you'll find an apartment key, and if you're really smart, you'll understand that it can be used to get into the apartment, which happens to be the next area of the game. After the bright outside of the town, you'll immediately notice the dark, gloomy contrast of the building upon entering. This section of the game is claustrophobic and dark, forcing the player to wander the halls with little to no light. Each floor greets you with uncomfortably narrow hallways. As you walk, you'll eventually hear your radio begin to go off, implying that you're not alone. Lying figures will be patrolling the corridors, but thankfully the hallway is big enough to run straight past them. There's no exact clear indication on what you're supposed to do next, so your best bet would be to just check every room. Rooms will be filled with puzzles, items, dead people, and enemies. A new enemy, mannequins, will be introduced here. They behave similarly to lying figures, but instead of monitoring a specific area, they'll stand idle until James gets within a certain range. The indoor parts of the game are always quiet, maybe interrupted by that subtle ambiance, but usually the only sound that accompanies you is your own footsteps. What makes these indoor areas so particularly scary is the fact of the unknown. Silent Hill is great at being unexpected. It keeps you on edge anytime you enter a new area. Anytime you enter a room, you'll never know what could be on the other side of a door. <gasps> On the third floor, the hallway is blocked off by jail bars. A key is seen on the other side and can be attempted to reach for. Ow! Ha ha! Hey, wait! Damn it! This is Laura, and there's not much to say about her at the moment, so I'll hold off until she appears again. Walking down one of the halls, you'll hear a scream off in the distance. <coughs> Heading in the direction of the noise, you will eventually come across a strange looking figure on the other side of the hall, which, you know, if you go into the other room, you know, you know, You'll also eventually come across the first puzzle in the game, and with many more to come. Silent Hill is known for having tricky puzzles, so much so that there's a separate difficulty for it. Now, I'm a pretty puzzly guy if I do say so myself. I enjoy the average puzzle thrown at me, and the team obviously had me in mind when creating these because they've easily surpassed my expectations. In fact, I don't think I was able to complete a single puzzle on my own. It's also worth putting out there that for most of the game, about every five minutes, I had to pull up an IGN guide because I had no clue where to go next. James re-encounters the strange figure from before in room 307, who's what seems almost neurotically abusing two mannequins as they writhe in pain. James attempts to remain stealthy by hiding in a closet with his flashlight on. successfully manages to send the creature away by shooting at it. 
this creature doesn't have an actual name, but is referred to in the game as the Red Pyramid Thing, but is commonly known more so as Pyramid Head. On the first floor and into room 101 is where you'll find the third person in this little venture. Someone can be heard throwing up violently in the bathroom, but to the left can be seen a corpse stuffed inside a refrigerator. Entering the bathroom, you will meet Eddie Dombrowski. <laughs> Eddie, without saying a word to him, immediately denies his relation with the dead body outside. This obviously makes him awfully suspicious, and it becomes clear that he did kill them. But we don't know why, or what his intentions are. James asks Eddie if he knows anything about the red pyramid thing he saw earlier, and he responds with, Pyramid thing? I don't know what you're talking about. Honest. I did see some weird looking monsters. What happened here anyway? Uh, I, I told you, I don't know. I'm not even from this town. I just, I just... You too, huh? <sighs> Something just brought you here, right? Uh, um, yeah, you could say that. We know that Eddie can also see the monsters around town. We also know that Eddie, like James and Angela, was brought to town for some reason, either by something or someone. After traversing through the apartment some more, you can find a newspaper about Walter Sullivan. Walter okay. murdered two innocent children and committed suicide in his cell by stabbing himself in the neck with a spoon. Before the police arrested him, he yelled out some strange stuff, such as, He's trying to kill me. He's trying to punish me. The monster. The red devil. On the second floor, you can head over to the fire escape, only to find that when you open the door, there's uh, literally nothing there. You can make the jump into the next apartment building with hope you can find your way out from there. Silent Hill 2 has some incredible moments in which not only will the plot unfold, but you'll learn more about who these people truly are. Inside room 109 is one of these moments. Oh, it's you. Yeah, I'm James. Angela. Angela, okay. I don't know what you're planning, but there's always another way. Really? But you're the same as me. It's easier just to run. Besides, is what we deserve. No, I'm not like you. We are reunited with Angela, and she doesn't appear to be in the best condition. I'm gonna kill myself! I previously mentioned the very stiff and mundane voice acting that almost everyone talks in. I believe this is done on purpose. You can see if there's something wrong with Angela, her being slow and fatigued to an unexpected change in mood where she becomes anxious and confused. She's clearly disturbed, something she's been through that we don't know about yet. The music playing in the background is one of the best in the game brilliantly encapsulating that feeling of hollowness and disorientation that Angela feels. James in the scene begins to contemplate on himself. When Angela tells him that they're the same, he strongly denies it, almost fearfully. Which makes you wonder, why? What does James have to hide? He considers himself crazy thinking Mary's still alive. James also talks in an odd, monotone voice, so it's safe to assume that he's gone through something as well. The game here begins to make you think on who to believe. She's dead? Don't worry. I'm not crazy. At least, I don't think so. Uh, I've gotta find my mama. Should I go with you? This town's dangerous. Now I know what you meant back there in the cemetery. I'll be okay by myself. Besides, i just slow you down. What about that? For me? Sure. No problem. If I kept it, I'm not sure what I might do.
You now have Angela's knife. Examining the knife, you can see the blade stained with blood. Upon entering room 209, faint whispering can be heard. If you play with headphones, the sound plays right directly in your ear. This freaked me out so much on my first playthrough because I didn't know whether it was the game or not. The key to your way out of the apartments is sitting on a bed, but there's still one last thing you need to face before you leave. You'll have to face off against Pyramid Head himself. The bosses in this game kind of, uh, well, they suck. You just sort of run around and shoot until something happens. Now, in my opinion, they should have slapped on Dark Souls mechanics for the bosses. <laughs> now that would have been sick! <laughs> Pyramid Head is incredibly powerful. Any chance he gets in successfully hitting you will most likely be fatal. Since he attacks you when you get near him, your best chance on beating him is using your gun. So be sure to stock up on lots of ammo, because you'll be soaking through rounds within seconds. Although you damage him, Pyramid Head shows no sign of pain whatsoever. He doesn't flinch once. It's obvious he's not human, but he's not like the other monsters we've seen. Once the fight is over, he just casually walks out of the place like he forgot his kid at daycare. After Pyramid Head leaves, you may exit as well and return to the foggy streets outside. After being cramped inside the decaying dark walls of the apartment, it feels refreshing to be let out. James now has a clear path to Rosewater Park, where he believes Mary might just be there. On the way, though, he encounters a familiar face. You! It was you, wasn't it? You're the one who stepped on my hand. I don't know. Maybe I did. What's a little girl like you doing here, anyway? Huh? Are you blind or something? What's that letter? None of your business. You didn't love Mary anyway. Wait! How do you know Mary's name? Laura is an interesting character. Out of everybody in the game, you see her the least. She's also the only one that shows no fear of the town's threats, nor does she ever acknowledge it. All we know is Laura has some connection to Mary, which means Laura probably knows about James as well. Yet, James shows no sign of recognition to her. Heading down the street ahead will lead you straight into the park. This is the place James was referring to, where he and Mary spent the whole day, staring out at the water. And within the fog, just up ahead, happens to be someone staring right out at the water. Mary? No, you're not. Do I look like your girlfriend? This is Maria, probably my favorite character in Silent Hill 2. She has such a distinctive and charismatic personality from everyone else in the game. Her captivating voice keeps the player intrigued by what she says or does next. Noticeably, she, Mary, and Laura are the only ones in the game that talk in a natural, humane tone. Yet, Maria is strange, mysterious. She'll leave you bewildered with her enigmatic actions, constantly having you racing your mind thinking, who is she? When you meet Maria, there's one very striking and significant feature about her that James picks on immediately. I can't believe it. You could be her twin face, your voice, just your hair and clothes are different. James is right, so much so that Maria and Mary actually both have the exact same face model. Sorry, I was confused. Where are you going? I'm looking for Mary. Have you seen her? Didn't you say she died? Oh yeah, three years ago. But I got a letter from her. She says she was waiting in our special place. Is this your only special place? Well, there's the hotel too, I guess. So, the hotel was your special place, huh? I'll bet it was. Don't get so mad. I was just joking. Anyway, it's not that way. It's this way.
You're coming with me? You were gonna just leave me? No, but... With all these monsters around? No, I just... I'm all alone here. Everyone else is gone. I look like... Her. Don't be ridiculous. So it's okay? Yeah, fine. Your next objective is to get to Lakeview Hotel. Except now, Maria will be joining you. She can, in fact, be attacked by enemies, and since she isn't armed, you'll have to defend her. If she dies, the game ends. Exiting the park and heading down the street, you'll find a bowling alley to the left. I'll wait here. I hate bowling. I didn't come here to play, you know. Hurry back, okay? Upon entering the building, there are two people already inside. So what'd you do? Robbery? Murder? Nah, nothing like that. Ha! Huh, you're just a gutless fatso. What'd you have to say that for? I thought you said the cops were after you. No. I just ran because I was scared. I don't know what the cops are doing. But if you did something bad, why don't you just say you were sorry? This actually isn't the only time Laura and Eddie have met. In the opening cutscene of the game, we can see them both together by a truck. It's possible that Laura got a ride from Eddie to Silent Hill. Did you find the lady you were looking for? What's her name? Mary? Bye-bye! Wait! Come back! Eddie, let's go after her! Huh? Laura? But why? Laura, is that her name? That's what she said. This town is full of monsters. How can you sit there and eat pizza? She said she was fine by herself. She said a fatso like me would just slow her down. Forget you. You can attempt to catch up to Laura, but we'll simply reach a dead end. It's no good. It's locked. I don't know why, but this scene is so unintentionally funny to me. Maybe it's because of how Maria always has the best response to James stating the obvious. Or because of how desperately down bad James is. The building you enter is a bar called Heaven's Night. Even though Maria has no background that we know of, this is where she works. Not just because she has numerous keys into the place, but this is where you start with Maria in the Born From A Wish DLC. The neon lights give the club a gloomy atmosphere, accompanied by a mellow soundtrack. Though it's a very small place, it stands out from other settings in the game, and it remains one of my favorites. Exit the club and proceed down the street where you'll catch a glimpse of Laura slipping inside a hospital. Unfortunately, you won't be getting to her for a while, so you can head on in and enter the next area of the game, Brookhaven Hospital. Even with Maria, this place is extremely scary. It shares a lot of similarities to the apartment, such as rusted walls and ominous ambience. They somehow also managed to make the place even darker. But it's not just the shadows that make the place dark. Brookhaven has a twisted, disturbing history hidden within itself. As you explore, you'll uncover memos and physical traces on how poorly the mentally ill patients were treated. Silent Hill brilliantly tells a whole other story using the environment without interfering with the main plot itself. Heading up to the second floor, you'll find a deadly new enemy. Nurses are the only monsters in the game that are armed, which means they can attack from quite a distance. They appear human enough from head down, retiring a rather revealing nurse outfit, while their head takes the shape of deformed and mangled flesh, constantly rattling and shrieking. When you get to the third floor, Maria will start to feel a bit exhausted. James. <coughs> Wait a minute. <coughs> I'm kind of tired. You should rest. Mm. <laughs> so comfy. 
I'm gonna go look for her. For Laura. I'll be back as soon as I can. Maria invites James to lay down with her. Does James accept? Nope. He just skedaddles out there like a champ. Literally, nothing phases through this hunk of a man. But a thing to take into account is Maria's sudden sickness. It seems she has a bit more in common with Mary than presumed. It's possible that James noticed the similarity and was uneased. Up on the roof of the hospital, you can find a memo from one of the patients. Other than that, uh, well, let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking through my script. Uh, uh, you, you, you guys, you guys hear that? Oh, 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 oh shit, crying, oh man! After Pyramid Head's warm welcome, you'll fall into a previously the fuck, inaccessible section of the hospital. The objective currently is to try and open this big old box. Inside is... A single strand of hair. But now, hear me out. With this piece of hair, you can, believe it or not, turn it into a fishing rope. Wow. And with it, you can get the elevator key. Now, though it may seem impossible, you can use this key to access the elevator. Now, who would have thought of that? Uh, well, me, obviously. Take the elevator down to the first floor, and you'll finally catch up back to Laura. Laura? Huh? You know my name? Eddie told me. That big, fat blabbermouth. How do you know about Mary? What's the big deal? Why can't you just tell me? You gonna yell at me if I don't? No, I won't. I was friends with Mary. We met at the hospital. It was last year. You liar! Laura, I... Fine, don't believe me. But last year, Mary was already... I'm sorry, Laura. Anyway, let's go. Wait, wait! There's something I gotta get! Later, okay? But it's really important! What is it? A letter from Mary. Huh? Get it, is that okay? Yes, yes. What are you doing, Laura? It's further back, in the desk. Laura! What are you doing? Ha ha, I tricked you. Open the door, Laura. Why should I? I'm a liar, right? Want me to open it? Huh? Huh? Do ya? What's the magic word? Laura? Okay. I guess it won't open it. I think I'll just leave you like this. You snotty little brat! Open up! Why, you... you... Laura? You hurt me! This twisted, sickening abomination is flesh lips, and you'll have the pleasure of fighting not just one, but two. And once you kill both, a third will decide to drop in. Flesh lips will descend down and strangle you with their feet. Since they remain on the ceiling, it's viable to try and shoot them with your firearm. They are a bit tough, but it shouldn't take too long before you take them down. However, once defeated, you aren't out of the hospital just yet.
James is still in the hospital, but you'll immediately notice something is different. In fact, almost everything is different. The building is now stained with rot and rust, eating away the foundation. The nurses now appear ravaged and much more aggressive. This is the other world. To some, it's a different dimension. To others, it may simply be a figment of the protagonist's mind. It's never completely clarified on what exactly the other world is, yet it appears repeatedly throughout the franchise. In the hospital, you can find the journal of a former doctor describing his conception, specifically from an outsider's perspective. Quote, the other side, perhaps may not be the best way to phrase it. After all, there is no wall between here and there. It lies on the borders where reality and unreality intersect. It is a place both close and distant. You may think that even though the hospital has been revamped, you still have your handy dandy map with all those markings until you pull it up and see that all the markings and all the areas that you previously explored have been wiped clean. Right back at square one, your heart sinks at the possibility of the unknown and what brand new horrors lie ahead. Oh, Maria. It's you. I thought you were... Sorry. Anyway, I'm glad you're alive. Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. I was almost killed back there. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life! You couldn't care less about me, could you? No, I... just... Then stay with me! The charming and sweet character suddenly vanishes, and some of Maria's true colors are revealed. On top of her hostile behavior, she is evidently making James feel guilty. James doesn't say anything to any of this, as Maria is the closest thing to Mary he has right now, and doesn't want to risk saying anything that might lose her. You really seem to care about her. Do you know her? I've never met her before. I just feel sorry for her. She's all alone. And for some reason, I feel like it's up to me to protect her. Once again with Maria, the search for Laura continues. Upon completion of the final puzzle, James will unlock a stairwell that leads further down into the building. The stairs lead down into a passage with long, narrow corridors that seemingly never end. You may be wondering if you perhaps took the wrong turn, until the sound of metal trailing against the ground grows closer, and the only thing to do now is run. Of course, a majority of us are unable to fully understand what James is feeling and going through. Many of us have never experienced such events in our lives. Yet Akira Yamoka, the game's music producer, manages to masterfully express James' emotions through the somber melody. The feeling of loss, confusion, desolation, grief. So haunting, yet so beautiful. The only thing James has left now is a glimmer of hope. Hope that out there, Mary really is waiting for him. 
That hope is what keeps so many of us going each and every day. But that hope can also be our undoing. The hospital has now been returned to its usual state. In one of the offices lies a note. He who is not bold enough to be stared at across from the abyss is not bold enough to stare into himself. The truth can only be learned by marching forward. The note advises that James heads to the Silent Hill Historical Society, and there, this dilemma might finally begin to unravel itself. The streets of Silent Hill are now clouded over by the night sky. The roads are now more hazardous than ever, with lying figures, mannequins, and even nurses on every street ready to strike. Nothing is particularly different since before, other than extra items scattered around. Although, there is a certain building that sparks some interest. Inside this bar, a message is left written on the wall. Traversing the highway of Silent Hill will eventually lead you to the Historical Society. Entering the faculty, it comes off as pretty normal. No corroding environments, no unsettling ambience, until you see it. Misty Day, Remains of Judgment, it's him. A grimy staircase leads you down into the depths of the building. Occasionally, something similar to a boat horn can be heard, as if signifying James's descent into this hellish place. Before you lies a hole in the ground, there's no clear indication on where it leads, only that it heads straight down. It's almost like staring into the abyss. Despite all its abnormalities, most of the places you visit are reasonable locations for a town like Silent Hill. Apartments, a hospital, recreational areas. Yet what unnerves me about the historical society is how separated it feels from the rest of the world. How this entire place exists under the town. The insanely long vertical drops send you deeper and deeper into what feels like hell itself. But the further you go, the more it feels as though you're reaching something. Some kind of revelation, and so desperately to find some answers, you take yet another plunge into the dark. Killing a person ain't no big deal. Just put the gun to their head, pow. You, you killed him? But, but, but it wasn't my fault. He, he made me do it. Calm down, Eddie. Tell me what happened. That guy, he, he had it coming. I didn't do anything. He just came after me. Besides, he was making fun of me with his eyes. Like that other one. Just for that, you killed him? What do you mean, just for that? Eddie, you can't just kill someone because of the way they looked at you. Oh yeah? Why not? Till now, I always let people walk all over me. Just like that stupid dog. He had it coming too. Eddie. <laughs> I was just joking, James. Eddie is now unhinged, nothing like we've seen of him previously. It would be suffice to say that he isn't one to be trusted, meaning that Eddie has in fact killed, one being the corpse we saw back in the apartment. Eddie probably killed others and could be on the run from the police as mentioned earlier. But why? Well, Eddie was bullied. For most of his life, he was constantly harassed and judged by his peers due to his physical appearance. To cope with his problems, he developed an excessive eating disorder. He was sick of it, both the bullying and his addiction. And as they continued, Eddie finally snapped, murdering one of his bullies and his dog. The place you now explore is Toluca Prison, built beneath the historical society. 
and though the game had its unsettling moments thus far, this is where the true horror occurs. The entire environment is tainted with blood, rust, and decay, by far the most deteriorated area that we've seen. Being so far beneath in this isolated location lost to time feels suffocating, except you aren't entirely isolated. The source of the sound is nowhere to be seen. It is there. You can see James looking above him, as he does when an item or monster is close. Not being able to see what's making that dreadful sound, but knowing it's in that cramped corridor with you, is horrifying. It's scary hearing something furiously sprinting in the darkness, and never knowing when it'll decide to reveal itself keeps you at the edge of your seat. Such a simple yet genius method so well executed. In the center of this vast open field is a gallow with three nooses. Upon looking closer, there's an Egyptian stylized drawing depicting what seems to be not one, but two pyramid heads. To exit the prison, James must head down even further. And the farther you go, a muffled noise, like someone screaming, begins to grow louder. And louder. And louder. And then it stops. The elevator will take you down farther than you can ever imagine. When it finally stops, James will set foot into what is known as the labyrinth. As its name suggests, the labyrinths take the form of this endless maze with no distinct exit, with identical halls of a crude, decaying building. Suffice to say, it's incredibly unlikely and batshit insane that a place like this would exist this deep down within the Earth, which means that the labyrinth is another formation of the other world. Now at the bottom of the barrel, James must seek the labyrinth for answers, except what you'll find next will have you searching for more. You're alive! Maria, I thought that thing killed you. Are you hurt bad? Not at all, silly. Maria? That thing, it stabbed you. There was blood everywhere. Stabbed me? What do you mean? It chased us to the elevator, and, James, and then- James, what are you talking about? Just before, don't you remember? James, honey, did something happen to you? After we got separated in that long hallway? Are you confusing me with someone else? <sighs> you were always so forgetful. Remember that time in the hotel? Maria? You said you took everything. But you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. How do you know about that? Aren't you Maria? I'm not your Mary. So, you're Maria? I am. If you want me to be. All I want from you is an answer. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. This is by far my favorite scene in the game. The amount of tension and emotions that build up in the room without any use of music. There's a reason why this scene is so popular in particular. Unlike everyone James has seen through the game, Maria is not human. Notice how she's never seen with anyone else other than James. Maria is not real. You may have had the suspicion ever since first meeting her, but it only got stronger once she started to disappear and was slaughtered in the hospital, but suddenly reappears completely fine, with no recognition of it whatsoever. Not only that, but she seemingly somehow shares Mary's memories. Yet Maria becomes offended and hostile when referred to her. So what really is she? To understand, we need to look into James first. Back to while Mary was still ill, 
For the longest time, James was forced to watch his beloved wife in misery while she's anchored to her hospital bed. Though he loves Mary dearly, this emotional pain brought frustration and began to drink as a result of the pain and loneliness. James also had sexual frustrations but prevented himself from pursuing anything. All these factors began to slowly eat away at James. After Mary died, his self-confidence dropped, progressing to deep grief and depression. Maria is a reflection of this pain. Created by the town, she exists in an attempt to fill the hole that's been dug in James. Though she resembles Mary in many ways, she has a much more erotic nature and appearance in order to appeal to James. Maria is the perfect Mary, everything he wanted from her during her illness. Yet she taunts, yells, and guilt trips him on numerous occasions. This is Silent Hill's way of testing James's loyalty and devotion to his wife. Don't you want to touch me? Maria invites James over to the other side for some naughty intentions, and he temptingly agrees. But the route to the other side is a long one, with many monsters in the way. Pyramid Head can be found patrolling these parts of the maze, instead now carrying a spear instead of his great knife. Angela can be found distressed by some horrid-looking creature. This abomination is considered a boss fight, but can be taken down relatively easily. Although Angela will take matters into her own hands. Angela, relax. Don't order me around! I'm not trying to order you. So what do you want then? Oh, I see. You're trying to be nice to me, right? I know what you're up to. It's always the same. You're only after one thing. No, that's not true at all. You don't have to lie. Go ahead and say it. Or you could just force me. Baby, I'm like, he always did. Ugh. You only care about yourself anyway. You disgusting pig. Angela. Don't touch me. You make me sick. This room, though it may not seem like it, displays the reasoning for who Angela is. Angela suffered from a violent and traumatic childhood due to being sexually and physically abused by her own father and brother. As a result, it took a massive toll on her mental health and has damaged her emotionally, becoming socially awkward and depressed. Even growing a fear of men as seen by pushing James away, the monster we fight is given the name Abstract Daddy. And while at first it seems like a giant lump of flesh, it's actually two people strapped over a bed frame. This isn't some random monster that found its way here. This is Angela's demon. Outside this room, a news article can be found. It reads of a man who was known for his drunkenness and violence was found murdered. He also has an awfully similar last name to Angela's, Orozco. This authenticates that Angela eventually killed her father and escaped her childhood of abuse. Afterwards, Angela faced suicidal tendencies as well as guilt, believing she needed to be punished for her actions. Angela, believe it or not, is actually only 19 in Silent Hill 2. Her traumatic childhood has given her an older physical appearance. You said your wife Mary was dead, right? Yes, she was ill. Liar! I know about you. You didn't want her around anymore. You probably found someone else. <sighs> That's ridiculous. James has always denied any accusations Angela made against him, right up until this point. He even falters mid-sentence and begins to question his own self, meaning even James cannot be trusted. As James finally reaches the other side, only more horror awaits him. Maria? Maria? Maria, no! What happened to you? James is once again forced to watch Maria taken away Why? from him, out of his control. This time, in a similar way to how Mary died, on a hospital bed, slowly being eaten away by some illness.
Your final stop in the labyrinths is an encounter with an unhinged Eddie, now completely having lost his mind. You fat, disgusting piece of shit! You make me sick! Fat ass, you're nothing but a waste of skin! You're so ugly, even your mama don't love you! Well, maybe he was right. Maybe I am nothing but a fat, disgusting piece of shit. But you know what? It doesn't matter if you're smart, dumb, ugly, pretty. It's all the same once you're dead. From now on, if anyone makes fun of me, I'll kill him. Just like that. Eddie, have you gone nuts? I knew it. You too. You're just like him, James. Hey, I didn't mean anything. Don't bother. I understand. You've been laughing at me all along, haven't you? Ever since we first met. I'll kill you, James. Unfortunately, as it turns out, only one of you is going to walk out of here alive. Do you know what it does to you, James? When you're hated, picked on, spit on, just because of the way you look? After you've been laughed at your whole friggin' life, this town called you too! You and me are the same! We're not like other people! Don't you know that? Let's party! Eddie is a decently tough boss, but you should have enough ammunition to take him down. While Eddie did turn out to be a bit crazy, he deserved better for what he had been through his entire life. Eddie? James has constantly been slaughtering monsters left and right this whole journey, but this time, he finds to his horror that he killed a real person. Mary. Did you really die three years ago? After what feels like a lifetime ago, you may finally step back outside into the foggy world. The game will spit you out onto a dock by Toluca Lake. A small boat awaits your arrival, which you can take to head to the final part of the game. Lakeview Hotel will be James's final destination, the very same hotel he and Mary stayed at three years ago. Did I scare you? Yeah, you did. You're here to find Mary, aren't you James? Laura was with Mary when she was admitted to the hospital, for reasons unknown, but during that time they bonded together to the point where Mary saw her as her own daughter. Laura has come to search for Mary in Silent Hill, being unaware of her death. Laura hands James the letter she talked about prior at the hospital, meant to be given to her after Mary passed away. It states how James didn't show much emotion or empathy while by Mary, which explains Laura's resentment towards him. If things turned out differently, Mary was planning to even adopt Laura. At the very end of the letter, Mary wishes Laura a happy 8th birthday. James then asks Laura how old she is. Um, I turned 8 last week. The events of Laura's story just don't add up to James's side. She couldn't have turned 8 three years ago, which means, with the evidence piled against him, James is wrong. Is this the quiet, beautiful place she was talking about? Me and Mary talked a lot about Silent Hill. She even showed me all her pictures. She really wanted to come back. That's why I'm here. Maybe you'll get it if you see the other letter. The one, Mary. Huh? I must have dropped it. Laura. I gotta find it. Laura! The hotel is now brimmed with various monsters, including Angela's abstract daddies, prowling with many floors. At reception, a note is left for him, stating he left a videotape here, the very same tape Maria mentioned earlier. 
you'll have to explore the resort from bottom to top to find the tape. Once found, James needs to now find the key to his and Mary's room. Near the end for most horror games, you've pretty much seen every scare the game has to offer, and aren't as affected as you were since you started. So, most games then decide to just give you a grenade launcher and blast your way through to the end, and that's where it usually turns from horror to the next COD. But this isn't most horror games, this is Silent Hill 2. There's a part where James has to take the elevator down, but must remove all his items and weapons. And of course, this also is literally the darkest part of the game, where you don't have a flashlight. And yo, yeah, 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 why not? Let's put some monsters down there as well. Little sections like these are what stick out and keep the horror of the game fresh, even until the very end. Room 312 is the same room we saw in the flashback with Mary. Beside the TV lies a cassette player, where James can insert the tape. Little does James know, though, that this tape contains the answer to everything. Are you taping again? Come on. <sighs> I don't know why, but I just love it here. It's so peaceful. You know what I heard? This whole area used to be a sacred place. I think I can see why. <sighs> it's too bad we have to leave. Please promise you'll take me again, James. At last, a twist is revealed. Mary didn't die from an illness three years ago. It was James who suffocated her with her own pillow. James, who couldn't bear watching Mary suffer any longer, killed her for both her sake and his. Mary didn't even die three years ago. If Laura's right, it's only been a week since she was killed. Supposedly, Mary's body is lying in the trunk of James's car, without him even remembering. The hotel becomes infested by the other world, causing the interior of the resort to fall into a dark and grotesque state, accompanied by this music, and again, the music does this incredible job in evoking James's emotions, the twisted guilt and sudden realization of what he's done. James can find an audio recording between him and the doctors about the severity of Mary's illness. Mary's going to die. As the game begins to close on itself, it also means we say goodbye to Angela. 
Inside one of the hotel rooms, she can be found at the top of a flight of stairs. The entire room is set ablaze, yet neither James nor Angela seem to be affected by it. Mama! Angela momentarily mistakes James for her mother before recognizing him and quickly apologizing. Angela, no. Thank you for saving me. But I wish you hadn't. Even Mama said it. I deserved what happened. No, Angela, that's wrong. No, don't pity me. I'm not worth it. Or maybe you think you can save me. Will you love me? Take care of me? Heal all my pain? As sad as it is, Angela's right. Through the amount of horrible trauma she's been through, it's too late for her. It would take years of care and compassion to barely help Angela back on her feet, and at the moment, James isn't the best person for that. Angela requests for him to return the knife, no. but he refuses, knowing she would use it to end her life. So Angela turns and heads upward, letting the flames consume her instead. It's hot as hell in here. You see it too. For me, it's always like this. The terrible noises of the radio and monsters abruptly come to an end. The final save of the game is before you, except instead of one red square, there lie nine. Something about this being different than the others lets the player know that this is it. There's no coming back from this. Without a moment's notice, both pairmen had simultaneously finished themselves for good. As James heads down this hallway, a conversation Mary? between him and a bitter, dying James? Mary can be heard. I, uh, I brought you some flowers. Flowers? I don't want any damn flowers. Just go home already. Mary, what are you saying? Look, I'm disgusted. I don't deserve flowers. Between the disease and the drugs. I look like a monster. Well, what are you looking at? Get the hell out of here! Leave me alone already! I'm no use to anyone. I'd be dead soon anyway. Maybe today. Maybe tomorrow. It'd be easier if they'd just kill me. 
But I guess the hospital's making a nice profit off me. They want to keep me alive. Are you still here? I told you to go! Are you deaf? Don't come back! Outside are fire escape stairs that lead up to the roof of the building. Mary? <laughs> Wrong again. Mary's dead. You killed her. Maria? Maria, I'm done with you. What do you mean? But I can be yours. I'll be here for you forever. And I'll never yell at you or make you feel bad. That's what you wanted. Now I understand. The problem is, you're not married. No, James. I won't let you. I'll never let you have your Mary back. Maria transforms into this... You know what? I, I don't even know what I'm looking at. I'll be honest, it's a bit disappointing for a final boss since it's just the same exact thing as every other boss fight. Defeated, Maria will collapse onto the ground. She can faintly be heard calling James, almost asking James. for mercy. But like all the other monsters, James. her service in Silent Hill is due. Mary? <coughs> James. Forgive me. I told you that I wanted to die, James. I wanted the pain to end. That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. No. That's not true. You also said you didn't want to die. The truth is, I hated you. I wanted you out of the way. I wanted my life back. James, if that were true, then why do you look so sad? Mary? James. Please. Please do something for me. Go on with your life. For surviving the wrath of Silent Hill, the town offers him a reward, Mary's letter. Not just the part from the beginning, but the entire thing she left for James before she died. When I first learned that I was going to die, I just didn't want to accept it. I was so angry all the time, and I struck out at everyone I loved most, especially you, James. That's why I understand if you do hate me. But I want you to know this, James. I'll always love you. Even though our life together had to end like this, I still wouldn't trade it for the world. We had some wonderful years together. <laughs> well, this letter has gone on too long, so I'll say goodbye. I told the nurse to give this to you after I'm gone. That means that as you read this, I'm already dead. I can't tell you to remember me. 
but I can't bear for you to forget me. These last few years since I became ill, I am so sorry for what I did to you, did to us. You've given me so much, and I haven't been able to return a single thing. That's why I want you to live for yourself now. Do what's best for you, James. James, you made me happy. In the end, we can see Laura walking off in the fields from a distance accompanied by James, where he'll now have a chance at a new start, finally putting Mary to rest. And that's it. That's Silent Hill 2. But not quite. The game actually has six different endings, though I'll only be talking about the three I consider worth discussing. None of the endings are considered to be the true ending. There is also no good or bad ending, but people interpret their own thoughts into which they consider to be canon. The first being the leave ending, the one that was shown, where James makes it out of Silent Hill redeemed of his actions. The second is the in-water ending, a much darker take than the one before it. Throughout the game, James must remain at a lower health state. From time to time, he must also examine the knife that Angela gave him. This knife represents a symbol of suicide, and with James inspecting it, his mind would be muddled with these dark thoughts. At the end of the game, the only difference is now, when reuniting with Mary, she will tell him that he suffered enough for killing her, and dies once again. James then picks up Mary's corpse from the bed and takes it out of the room. James, with Mary in his car, drives full speed into the lake, burying himself in his car as a coffin with his wife so that they can be together in death. Now we can be together. The third ending is the Maria ending. As stated by its name, James must be increasingly protective of Mary to assure no harm comes to her. In the end, James fights an angry Mary who hasn't forgiven him for her death. Maria? He returns to the park only for Maria to miraculously show up Mary. and decides to leave Silent Hill with her. It's okay. I have you. It's a more cynical end to the game, where James learns nothing and continues to live with a hallucination of his desires. But Silent Hill doesn't let him go that easy, as when the two are heading towards the car, Maria begins coughing. You'd better do something about that cough. The other three endings go completely bazonkers to the point to which I don't believe is canon. Oh my no, she was a totonaka. What the dog doing? And though that's it with the story, there's still a bunch of stuff I haven't covered. One of the biggest things I want to touch upon is the use of symbolism. Silent Hill tells a story using not only its characters, but with the environment. Its central theme is basically what constitutes a broken person and how that functions within trauma. To show that, Silent Hill is packed with subtle details that build the world around it. The town of Silent Hill brings in those who have done bad deeds or have dug themselves into a hole no one can get them out of. There, it imposes its visitors to re-experience their deepest, darkest fears and traumas, having them look into their own minds, another world, in hopes that they can make amends with themselves. Eddie's other world is manifested from his trauma of being bullied and his eating disorder. The town constantly confronts him with corpses everywhere he goes, presumably the bodies of his victims. At the bowling alley, the town presents Eddie with pizza to see his response, yet Eddie clearly shows no sign of culpability. If anything, Eddie seems to be having a blast. Compared to both James and Angela, Eddie has fallen so far that he's entirely broken and insane. Silent Hill gave him the chance and has proven that there is no redemption for him, no purpose for him, and left to be disposed of. In fact, before Eddie's fight, there is a room filled with four gravestones, each labeled the names of Eddie, Angela, Walter, well and James. Each of the gravestones are either partially or completely filled, and those being Eddie's, Angela's, and Walter's. All except for James. James, still at that point, can make a choice for himself. 
Angela's other world is created around her abusive childhood. If you recall, Angela was originally drawn here to find her mother in hopes to unite with her only family left. Unfortunately, this was only another delusion by the town to draw her in. Angela had it hard, as Silent Hill took her suicidal tendencies against her, making her question if murdering her abusers was justified or not. She's also confronted by a horrific manifestation of her father, but overpowers it. Angela has enough courage to fight back against her demons, which shows she is more capable than Eddie. But just like everyone else, Angela has done bad deeds and gone through enough trauma to the point where she's mentally broken, and there is little to no redemption for her. James even pities and attempts to console her, yet even he knows there's no point. Angela just has nothing left. But she mentions how her had. mother, the one person she was looking for, Your the one person she probably still cared for, said she had it coming to her, that she deserved all of it. If a family is meant to bring you into the world and help shape yourself into you, then Angela truly is no one, merely a shadow of someone who was never there. To me, Angela is the most tragic character of the three. She is one of, if not the best and most realistic representation of an abuse victim in any video game. It's easy to sympathize with her because of her victimized character. Since the very beginning, her mind is completely muddled, and every encounter we have with her leaves us consoling her well-being. Laura is the only exception here where she has no demons or past to confront, and is only here in search for Mary. Her soul is pure, explaining why she doesn't see any monsters throughout the game. And then there's James Sunderland. The entire game is pretty much his other world. We see hints around the town trying to have him remember his actions. Like how Silent Hill challenged Angela with a knife and Eddie with pizza, James was given Maria, a mocking recreation of what he wanted from Mary, at least while she was sick. Constant contemplating reminder always pushing it further by dying again and again, driving that guilt deeper into James. Now, how James handled that was up to you, the player. Either he's strong enough to understand what he's done and overcome it, and goes on to continue his life with Mary's wish, or he crumbles under the weight of his own remorse and ends his own life. Silent Hill brings these people together, all who have suffered severe trauma and committed murder. What I love about this game is how it raises the question if murder is justified. Taking the life of another human being is a heinous and unforgivable act, but what if it was done for their own sake? If it was the only possible way to end the pain and misery they have to go through, are they forgiven? I suppose the answer is up to you. The environment isn't the only thing that symbolizes someone's mind. Many, if not all the monsters and creatures encountered, also play a part in telling James' story. For instance, the commonly recurring lying figures is just someone in a hospital straitjacket, constantly writhing and twitching around. This represents Mary while she was still sick and the frustration of her constant immobility and being stuck in her hospital bed, hence the name Lying Figure. Lying figures attack by spitting some deadly mist which could allude to sickness and even vomit. Both the mannequins and the nurses from the hospital are a representation of James's sexual frustrations and desires during the period of Mary's hospitalization. When the mannequins are first introduced back at the apartments, a normal mannequin is displayed wearing Mary's clothes. The nurses are always twitching their swollen and deformed faces, as if trying to shake something off, but this is merely a callback to Mary being suffocated by a pillow, struggling against James's forceful grip. The Flesh Lips boss back from Brookhaven are both trapped in cages, symbolic again to how confined Mary was during her illness. The lips on each of these characters represents Mary's mouth, which abused James with her harsh and cruel words during her last few days. But I saved one of the most important monsters for last, because of how mysterious yet significant it was to James's other world, that being the infamous Pyramid Head. There's no doubt something much more to it, since it's a recurring creature that remains unkillable by any means, until the very end of course. Pyramid Head is clearly another manifestation of Silent Hill, meaning it has some sort of significance to James, but what exactly? Pyramid Head is supposed to be the physical manifestation of James Sunderland's guilt and inner torment. In a sense, he's a reflection of James, constantly punishing him by reflecting his own actions and impulsions to him, in hope that James will wake up from his delusional state and remember his past actions. When James first finds Pyramid Head in the apartments, he's seen abusing the two mannequins in a weird, erotic way. Here, Pyramid Head is attempting to mock James' sexual desires by raping the creatures right in front of him. Evidently, Pyramid Head's murder of Maria, twice, was another wake-up call directed at James. Now, why there were two Pyramid Heads at the end of the game, I don't actually have an answer for, and as far as I've seen, there isn't actually one. Pyramid Head existed to serve as a judge to James, waiting until James proves himself guilty. Once done, his purpose is served, his mission accomplished, and with nothing left to do, disposes of himself. 
I personally adore Pyramid Head, everything from the badass design to his potent purpose. He remains one of my favorite fictional characters. When designed by Masahiro Ito, even with a human body, Pyramid Head was intended to not have a face, intending to dehumanize him and give him a more unsettling appearance. Ito refuses to reveal what lies beneath the monster's helmet, believing it's much more effective to leave it to the player's own interpretation. Unfortunately, even knowing that Pyramid Head's sole purpose was only to serve in Silent Hill 2, his character was milked and used in countless future Silent Hill games and movies, creating him the poster boy of the franchise. Now, with a much more grisly and muscular appearance, he's depicted as some kind of boogeyman, punishing not just one, but anyone for their wrongdoings. He just skins them alive or some fucking shit, I don't know, I don't really care. It just sucks that a purpose for such a great character has been repeatedly shit on. There's one last thing I'll be discussing about, and it's something a bit more deeper, and personal I suppose. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned my love for Silent Hill 2, and how much I connect to it. For the longest time, I just haven't been at my greatest, and my mental health has been sitting pretty darn low. I honestly don't even remember where it began, but it's not been doing me any good. I've been distant and lost with my family, my friends, and with reality. Most importantly, I've lost myself. Unless you've gone or going through it, you cannot imagine how difficult it is to spend every passing day while holding yourself together and not shattering into a million pieces. You become completely empty. That feeling of being lost is it's so hard to express. Yet somehow in some way, Silent Hill 2 manages to do it perfectly. Playing as James and watching him in his depressive state, it felt understandable and even sympathetic. Ever since that very first cutscene with him examining himself in the mirror, being deeply depressed, you aren't ever really there. You become numb, bored, aimless, hopeless. There's times where you don't feel like making connections with anyone and just talk like a robot. You become so self-centered on your own suffering that you almost want to suffer. You draw yourself closer to the thing that causes you pain because you've become desperate to feel for something. But watching James made me realize that it's okay to feel how you do. That I'm not the only one. I felt oddly understood. I know I'm not alone, and I know that I can accept myself, giving me motivation and confidence to heal into a better person. The settings in the game, while being so sickening and ravished, is so hauntingly peaceful, comforting. The town especially feels peaceful and still like some sort of purgatory. It's cozy. And the most important aspect out of all comes to be the music. I wasn't ever the biggest fan of music itself before Silent Hill. I appreciated it, but nothing more than that. After blasting through Silent Hill 2, one of the things that stuck with me was the soundtrack. Each and every area in the game, though it looked relatively the same, was given its own unique feel. The music in this game is nothing short of phenomenal. Other than just being damn good music, it also touches with me emotionally, resonates with my troubled self. There's literally nothing else out there that does it the same way this does. Whenever I fall into a bad mental state, I come back to Silent Hill. It soothes me, relaxes me, comforts me. It may seem bizarre to some, but it's the only one that understands me when I need it the most, and I'm forever grateful for that. Alas, with that, we finally reach the end. I spent about a good year and a half working on this, on and off. Probably my biggest personal project I've ever done in my life. But in case you haven't noticed, this game means a lot to me. And this video was something I was very passionate and proud about making. It made me happy, and I hope you enjoyed it too. There's obviously a bunch of stuff I missed and didn't cover, such as Maria's Born From A Wish DLC. If I have enough time and energy and gets enough traction, then yeah, I'll cover that too in a different video. And, of course, the revival of the Silent Hill franchise was announced a while ago, as well as the remake of Silent Hill 2. That actually gave me some massive motivation to finish this video, so thanks Konami! The trailer looks fantastic, everything shown so far looks super polished and clean. I think they really nailed the town's foggy atmosphere. I do think the indoor areas are a bit bright and not as dirty as they should be. A lot of people aren't saying he looks too old, but I personally am a fan of the new James. What I don't like or am worried about is how they might handle James' display of emotions and depression throughout the game. How they will handle delicate subject matters such as Angela and Eddie's storyline. We're capturing that Silent Hill horror from the original. Bloober, the dev team responsible for remaking the game, has had some not bad, but mediocre horror games at best, such as The Medium and Observer. 
Yet the people there at Bloober Team seem very passionate about Silent Hill 2 and are eager in recreating the sequel in the best way they can. I am so incredibly excited for the future of Silent Hill, as no doubt I have my concerns and worries, but what matters most is that we enjoy what we get and cherish it. I think that pretty much wraps up everything I want to say. Again, I truly hope you enjoyed the video. There is one last thing I kept until the very end. A thank you. A sort of love letter to Silent Hill 2. But I'll be signing myself off. So until next time, this is Balloon of Pizzas, signing out. Thank you.